Okay, the, uh, I've actually got about three hours worth of material here. I'm just going to give you cherry pick uh, pieces out of that material, but if anyone wants to see the full slide deck or see all of the examples, all of the code is um, up on uh, GitHub. All of the slides are on SlideShare, so you can go and grab those uh, at your leisure and go through some of the examples that are there. Okay, so a um, little bit of an intro, and then I'm going to look at different pieces of the testing puzzle. Okay, so um, what I'm really trying to do is get you thinking about what the possibilities are for testing your applications. And now, I had Groovy on the first slide. The concepts that I'm talking about aren't specific to Groovy at all. Um, you'll be able to do them in, as we saw in PostScript and uh, Latin and all sorts of other languages as well. You can apply all the concepts that we're going to cover in, in your, your language. And uh, I'm mainly going to use a, a little web application as a sample app just to test something. You can use the concepts for testing anything. It can be APIs, it can be web applications, web services, database systems, whatever it is that you've uh, got to hand. But to keep things within the limited time we've got today, I'll, I'll just focus on one, one little example and we'll look at novel ways to test it. Okay, what you're probably using now and then we'll evolve it in a few different directions. Things that will allow you to show your tests to end user customers and things that will allow you to, to uh, write uh, tests in ways that capture the information that you actually, you know, that came from deriving how you got the test cases or what you're trying to test. So we'll look at some novel things as, as we go along. I'm mainly going to try to focus, I'm going to, again, the concepts apply to testing at a variety of different levels. Um, so one of the things I'll show you, uh, quick check, I use that quite a lot at the unit, at the unit test level as well as at, at higher levels. I'm mainly going to focus showing you things at a sort of a high level acceptance test sort of level today, but again, it, it is fairly broad the way you can use the concepts that we'll be looking at. I'm going to uh, focus a little bit more, so I guess one of the messages that I've, that I've been telling people for the last five years is move towards scripting based testing. So that's just a simple thing. Move towards that, it'll get you a long way. There's lots and lots of th possibilities that are opened up to you if you move in that direction. So I tend to push people in that way and I tend to push them in ways that will allow them to refactor their tests and leverage those tests in, in a variety of different ways and we'll see some of that today. But it, it turns out that if you do have vendor tool, some vendor tools that you know, often were locking you in, they're starting to open those tools up to actually allow you to do scripting. If you like putting acceptance style tests in wikis and things so that, so that non-hardcore you know, programmers can create those tests, you can now start refactoring wikis, and I'll show you some little things in that area as well as we go along. There's some actually very interesting stuff happening in that space. So I'm not going to try to sell you too hard on scripting is the only way possible, but I'm going to show you a way to, you know, some, some ways to do things that allow a whole lot of possibilities, and we'll have a look at that as we go along. Okay, this is our little um, application that we're going to test. It's a very, very simple one. Okay, it... Um, it might coincidentally look like uh, some cartoon characters you may have seen on TV, totally coincidental in case there's any uh, uh, Hollywood executives in the audience. It happens to have some, some names that might look familiar, but uh, that's just to make it a, an example that we, we don't need to uh, explain too much. So here's our little web application. We can create new entries and things, so we can create some title, pick someone who's doing it, pick a category, and put in some content, and create a post, and we've now got a new entry in our in our blog. We can go back and look at uh, all the entries, we can go delete entries and things like that. So we want to test this application and we want to look at ways that we can test this that actually uh, capture smarts about the, the, our particular business domain, our particular um, you know, ap application area. So there's a number of different things that we'll be able to do. Okay, so a question. Now you probably, from the back it'll be a bit hard to see there's some code, sort of Java or Python looking code. It's actually Groovy code. I won't spend, I'm not, again, the, the details of Groovy aren't important for today's talk. It happens to be a language that lends itself to, to writing these kinds of things. Um, over here is sort of a more English looking bit of code. This happens to also be Groovy code, much like the Latin that we just saw. Um, you can write things in bunch of, with using just a bunch of words. Now, my question is, which is better, the one on the left or the one on the right? Does anyone, anyone have a gut feel which they'd prefer to see? So why the, why the one on the right? Yep. 
Sorry? Self-documenting, perhaps, to some degree. Yeah. Any, any other t things? Readable, yeah. The intent, probably fairly clear or whatever. Um, well, it, being a consultant, I've got a stock answer for, for, for uh, which one is better, and it depends. And it does, de it does depend. So, turns out you can start off with code like this, and if you do have code like this, you'll get very good IDE support. Okay? You'll get full completion inside Eclipse and so on. So there's some advantages to this. I can get right down to low-level information, like what's the name of the button that I'm about to click? What's the name of the form field? Now, if that kind of information is important to me, maybe the one on the left is more important, okay? is, is more valuable to me. Okay, so sometimes we want to actually get down to a, level, a low level of detail and be able to test at that level. If, I'm, if it's my responsibility to know exactly what the forms are, because we've, we've told our third-party business parties, here's the names of the fields on the forms, somewhere we've got to get down to low-level details and check the names of the fields on a form. So there is a place for the stuff over here on the left. But usually, most of the tests that you write, you want to hide away that noise. Okay? You want actually have to have tests like this. So if you kind of look at, if you were showing this test to someone in the business domain, you kind of look at Okay, what are the terms that are meaningful to someone in that domain? So if you're writing blog entries, you want to create entries, you want to put things in, you know, create a title, create a ca select a category, and submit a post, right? They're the kind of things. So if you kind of look at the terms that are important to someone in that business domain, what's the, con the, the relative content of those terms compared to the whole text? You kind of see over here, there's a lot of boilerplate noise, whereas over here, we're getting up to a much higher percentage of terms that actually are meaningful. And that's the kind of thing that we typically want to do. Okay, but as I said before, there's, there's, there's some pros and cons. So here I said we had full IDE completion. We've got APIs with parameters of known types and things like that. Over here, we may or may not have full IDE completion. In fact, uh, using most of the modern day languages, you can actually get full IDE completion over this side as well these days. Okay, but I'm going to show you some tools where you do get IDE completion and some where you don't. And depending on your customer, it may, not, it may or may not be important. If you're trying to show this to business analysts or end-user customers, they probably don't have Eclipse installed. If they have Eclipse installed, they probably don't have the path set up. They probably don't know how to drive it. So even if you give them something that's in it as, as a text file, um, that's probably just as valuable to them as what's over here. Okay? But we can actually get uh, the best of both worlds these days, and we'll see some examples of that. So again, just the same code that we saw before, just to sort of um, show an alternative direction that we can go. We can, we want to go from this sort of code typically to the text that we saw, but alternatively these days, and, and only fairly recently have I been happy with the uh, options, you can go and do things like move um, towards uh, wiki style or um, declarative ways of capturing your test information. Now I'm going to show you some declarative ways using wikis, some declarative ways using text, some declarative ways using Groovy code. So this is fairly declarative as well. And in fact, I can actually turn this to, be, to, to capture almost the same information that's here, much like what we saw in the Latin example. You can go and convert things and, and do a lot of tricks in, in languages. The, the modern languages are very, very powerful at creating uh, domain-specific languages, uh, testing DSLs, basically. So we'll, we'll have a look at that. And, and the nice thing about this is that you can iteratively refactor these things these days, which is one of the things I didn't really like about the wiki style solutions. And I, I still, when I do these wiki style solutions, I still have ref, highly refactored testing DSLs in Groovy code typically underneath those wikis. Okay, so I, my testers can fully leverage the solutions, but um, the end user business customers, they, we can give them this or we can give them this depending on the circumstances. And when we, when we give them this sort of thing, we can package that up in a number of novel ways as well. Okay, now if, you, if you're interested in this sort of whole area, one of the, the nice books that's come out recently, the, there's been a lot of talk in, along the lines of what I'm, what I'm um, espousing today over the last five years. This book probably summarizes a fair bit of it up. Specification by example is an, uh, a couple of early ones by the same author, but specification by example is, uh, is a good one. It doesn't contain um, a lot of code samples, but it's got all the concepts in it. So basically you're trying to move away from 
low-level technical activities, so open the shop homepage, log in with this user, and test password, move, getting away from this sort of low level, moving up, and, and I guess I should have prefaced all of these things with, um, well, there's an underlying thing if you're trying to automate your tests across my whole talk. So if you're doing manual testing, you know, move to any of the solutions that I'm talking about. Even the low-level code will usually put you in a better place. Again, the, if you stay at that low-level code and want to do lots of automated testing, it can be a lot of work. So if you move towards the higher-level things, you can actually get a long, long way with your automation with much, much less effort as well. So there's lots of advantages to moving in this direction. So we're, anyway, we're trying to move away from this up to higher-level things that actually get closer and closer to declaratively specifying your business rules, your business processes. So what we want is free delivery is offered to customers to deliver two or more books. So that's, a, that's an actual specification. And it turns out that's a very, very good way to capture things, and we can actually use those exact, that exact wording. You know, that can be the entire test. Right? Similar tr tricks to what we just saw in Latin. That can be the entire Groovy test. You can do this in, in Scala, Ruby, and Python, whatever your favorite uh, language might happen to be. And I guess PostScript and Latin as well. I didn't uh, include those previously in this talk as examples you might want to try. But, uh, I guess that's left as an exercise to the reader. Um, now, the good thing about capturing things at this level is you can go and totally refactor many layers below that. You can change the look of your website. You can change the middleware stack that you're using. The wording that's on here will probably not change. Okay? If you go and rejig the workflow, the steps that people um, move through your a website, you've gone to a whole new shopping cart uh, solution that you've provided. Maybe the individual steps in here are quite different now. Maybe the, the users you've got to use on different systems will change. Maybe, maybe the, the, um, the URLs have changed in your system. Maybe some CSS information has changed and now the names of things or, or um, you know, your IDs or whatever in your tags have changed. If you code your tests at this level, you'll be doing lots of refactoring. You won't get as much value out of your tests. If you do the sort of refactoring and architecturing and structuring that I'm uh, sort of going to suggest, you'll write your tests like this, and usually if things change, there'll be one place down in your testing DSL or in your, in your sort of library of, of, of code that you'll change, and everything else will uh, fix itself up. Okay, so, so this is kind of, this kind of uh, the parts that'll be in a system that is using these sorts of techniques. You'll typically have some sort of library that's going to, pretend to be the user. Okay? It'll be doing HTTP requests, just like your browser will do when you're typing things in manually, over to some sort of web server. There's a number of different libraries that are out there. So if you've um, heard of Selenium or what Wattier or uh, WebTest or HTML Unit or um, there's a whole lot of them, and depending on your, the, your favorite language, there'll be different names for, for the libraries that you can use. There's basically two categories, and I'm not going to go into the details, but there's basically browser emulators that don't actually create a graphical representation of what the user would see, typically. They can actually, uh, these days, do snapshots that uh, show you what the user would see. Um, and there's ones that actually fire off real browsers, and there's actually merits to using both of those at different times, but that's not for today's talk. What you will typically have is some sort of test runner that calls into one of these libraries. Okay, so you'll write your tests, and the original um, uh, Groovy code that was on the, the left-hand side, the sort of API-looking code, is the typical kind of thing. It'll be using a JUnit or NUnit type uh, runner. You'll write codey looking stuff, and it'll be calling into some library. It'll be saying, go, you know, go and go to this page, fill in this form field, click this button, and you'll have all of the steps there, and that's how you'll start out. What you'll, um, and, and you've got the other, there's wiki runners, there's other textual runners. I'm going to show you Cucumber and a few other things as well, uh, very br briefly as we, as we travel along this journey today. Now, what we typically do is start to refactor things. So instead of having lots of noise in our test, at, at the test level, we start building up a little mini library that's what we would call a, t a testing DSL. And actually, um, we tend to even refactor that into layers, and I'll show you one, just one example of something that's a useful layer as we go through. And the nice thing is once, you, once you've got yourself a, a system where everything that you uh, want to be able to do is really, really trivial to call with a single API, you can start doing some fancy stuff. You can start doing all sorts of data-driven type testing, 
uh, all sorts of uh, advanced testing. We're going to look at model-driven model testing. We're going to look at capturing tests as business rules and all sorts of other things. We'll, it'll be a really fast-paced uh, talk as we whiz through some of these as we go along, but there's a lot of really interesting things that y you can do, and it's all enabled by the fact that you've got a scripting layer there. Okay, you've got your testing DSL layer there, and you can go and put whatever other things on top of that. Okay, so if you want to see all of the examples, the, the, the full suite, there's a whole bunch of drivers. You can go and look at HTML units, Selenium, um, uh, Jeb is a really nice one, uh, Tellurium, all sorts of ones. You can go look at some of the runners, Cucumber, uh, Robot Framework, Concordian, whatever your favorite one might be, and so forth. We're going to probably just look at the underlying ones. I'll, I'll just jump through a, a few little bits out of here, and I'll, um, I'll dive into some code and show you some of that. And we'll, 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 we'll have a bit of a look at some of these advanced ones, because they're sort of exciting ones, and they're probably ones you haven't thought of before. So that's pretty much what the journey is going to be. Okay, there is um, all of the, the entire suite here is, is all just Groovy code. So even, though, even if I'm using Cucumber, and it's, uh, there's a few different variants of Cucumber these days, one of the variants actually has the full JRuby stack underneath the covers. I never see that. I just write a little bit of Groovy code, call out to a library, and it just runs all the JRuby stuff underneath. When I'm using Robot Framework, there's Jython underneath. I never see any of the Python code, or whatever. So I've just got Groovy. I'm not trying to sell you on Groovy today. It's Java flavored, gets rid of some of the noise, because that's really good for doing our testing DSLs, and it adds, we saw PostScript with functional capabilities and uh, closures. Well, uh, Groovy adds those sorts of features as well. Okay, again, I'm not going to give you a tutorial on Groovy, but if you're interested, that's some, some Java code that does some list processing. That's some Groovy code that does some list processing, so we just renamed the file from .java to .groovy. So you can go and, if you're a, a Java programmer, it's trivial to go and use this sort of stuff. Groovy also has some idioms where we can say, actually, you know, the compiler is smart enough to go and point to me exactly at a, a particular point in my source file and say, hey, there's a semicolon missing right here. That's the only thing that's possibly allowed right here, and it's missing, so I'm not going to go any further. Well, if it's smart enough to uh, tell you that, why isn't it smart enough to be able to put it in uh, when it needs to? And that's sort of what Groovy does. So there's some stuff here that's boilerplate that um, is basically spoon-feeding the Java compiler, and we can get rid of that if we want. And so that's a little bit better. But in fact, there's still some stuff here that's a bit boilerplate-ish, so we can get rid of that. So that's the equivalent uh, code that if you were using the Groovy idioms. And basically, what the Groovy compiler is doing is converting it to the original Java we saw under the covers. But that's that's not really uh, what today's about. I can, if you don't you still think this is a little bit too programmy looking, a lot better than what we originally saw. But you can you can go basically to the full. Uh, wordy style things like we saw in, in the Latin style, you can just have a bunch of sentences okay, using some tricks. This, the tricks to use it is just under here. I'm not going to go into the specifics of that today. So that's, that's just the little whirlwind tour of Groovy. It's, it's, it's not, that's not important. If you're, if you're a, a fan of one of the other languages, there's a bunch of other languages that can do similar things. Groovy just happens to be a really good one to pick. And if you've got... Um, um, if you've got Java programmers, then they won't have any trouble at all um, getting used to that. Okay, so um, what I'm going to do is just quickly flick over and I'll see how we go getting font sizes right that you can read. It's not all that important that um, you see all of this. So, so this this is the if you go to that GitHub site, you can go and pull down all of these examples, and you can go and look at all the uh, the, the different examples that we saw. So I'm just going to go and at the driver level, there's about 10. I'm going to just look at two, HTML unit and Jeb, just as two particular um, samples. So in here, there's actually a whole bunch of uh, different source files in here. And this represents a journey that if we had a couple of hours spare, I'd take you on that shows you how you can start off with very low-level code and then refactor it and refactor it and get it to, to a nice-looking code. So um, we'll start off with... with um, a sort of a fairly low-level code. This is similar to what we saw at the start. So that's the kind of thing you might start out with. So this goes and creates a little web client thing here, and then it goes and fills in different form fields. And this is sort of code. And if, you've, if your developers are the people who uh, write your code, they'll be right at, uh, right at home over at, at this level, and they'll be all happy. It'll be a lot of effort to create your tests if you stay at this level. So we'd typically go and do things, and you might create a 
if you, if you go and look at what people have been doing over the last few years, you'll hear them talk about things like creating fluent APIs. There's examples in here to do that. We'll skip beyond that and we'll um, create a little testing DSL. The actual details of the testing DSL are down here. They're not important for us. This is what the, um, the code looks like in this part of it. Whoops, if I get my cursor in the right window and hit the right key. Um, so this is now starting to look like Englishy looking uh, sentences. Okay, and depending on the actual approach that I can do this, I can get ones with only a very small amount of IDE completion, or I can go the whole hog and get full IDE completion and, and whatever in my testing DSLs. Now you can see this is still in a file that uh, with all the curly braces and other things that um, we, we saw that uh, non-techy people might not be uh, familiar with. It's got method calls and things like that. We can actually hide all of that away as well and turn it into just the lines that you see there. And that's what, uh, if there was a tester on your team or you're showing your, your uh, subject matter experts or your business analysts, you'd just be showing them that code there. And in fact, we, we set them up, we go and install a Groovy console on their system, we'll just email them that code, they cut and paste it into their console, hit run, runs the test, and they say, yep, that's what I want the system to do. And that's, that's the kind of level that we typically use these things at. Turns out that when we're running tests in our continuous integration suites, that's the level we're also working at. And we're going to see how things that you can do to uh, go beyond that as well. Now, I've kind of um, skipped a little step here that I didn't tell you about. And I'll just briefly mention it. So as part of the refactoring level, to get from the bottom level code up to here, we'll often um, create little testing helpers. And um, got my helpers here. What's a good one that's using those helpers? Um, this might be as good an example as any. Okay, so in this particular example, what I've done as part of my refactoring and moving towards having a, a structured uh, set of uh, helper objects in my in my at my testing, you know, it's a it's a I create helper objects that allow me to write tests very very simply. So I've created a helper object here called um, it's a blog tester. I give it a URL and I can go do things like check the title on a page, post the blog, check the uh, heading matches. So at this level. Um, what I can start doing now is getting rid of a lot of the, the noisy detail that was in the test. So this is sort of an intermediate thing, not quite as far as the, the DSL. The nice thing about the, um, this, having this sort of layer, first of all, I can write my testing DSL, the English looking one, in terms of this. And now if anything changes, I've usually got one spot. If, if, the, tit if the, the details of how to get the title change, you just go into the, the definition of the, of the check title method, Change, this is the low-level code that's sitting inside there. You'd go and change that in one spot, and your test suite would still run. Okay, so if you're looking to create automated test suites with minimal effort, you do want to do this sort of refactoring. Okay, but you don't want that noise to go all the way up to necessarily to all the people who are writing the tests. It depends on the circumstances of your organisation. Now, just back in the um, in this file here, I've I've actually created inside this blog tester. I actually created. Um, two levels of helper inside there, just just to illustrate a particular point. The, this, so in the first, so this, this particular um, test test method here actually has two tests in it. One that's the, the one I showed you first. It's actually got another one, and I'm now using a, a super u butte method call that bundles everything into one. So I've just got a post and check method. I just give it the name of the title, the, the name of the category, the content, and it goes and it posts all that information into the page, clicks the button to submit the post, gets a new page up that, that shows that it's actually been submitted, checks that all of the content is on the new page, all in one method call. So now I can just, if I want to create a new, a new test, I've just got that one line and I just put in new details and, and off I go. Now, going back to my original thing is it depends, is it good enough to write all my tests like that? Well, maybe not, because sometimes I actually want to go and check very, very specific details. And if those specific details are important to me, that's the level when I should stop my testing DSLs. Right? So um, again, there's a, there's a big, long talk we could do just on this topic. But 
what you typically do is what you start from that low-level code, and as you're moving towards the high-level testing D DSL, you put in a little bit more effort, and your tests get simpler. A little bit more effort, your tests get simpler. But at some point, you've got to draw the line and say, I don't want to go any simpler than this. I I'm not going to really get the business value by go doing, making things prettier and prettier and making them converting it into Latin. Maybe that's not going to add a lot of value to my customer, so I'll stop just before I get to that phase. Going to a single method may be too far if your customer is very, very particular about checking that certain fields are on certain places. Some, maybe it's worthwhile having both, and that's what I've done. In lots, of, in lots of my tests, I can use, use this, um, this particular common one, but it turns out when I want to check for, that certain error conditions um, have uh, taken place, it's actually quite handy to be able to, um, to go and check down just one level of, of detail down. So I've actually supported both in this particular framework, and that's the kind of thing you'd want to do. Okay, so just while we're talking, and I've got to get on to some of the, the, the interesting stuff, just while we're talking, I'll show you one more example at this sort of driver level, and it's a thing called Jeb. It happens to be um, solely a, a full Groovy-based um, uh, testing framework. So um, it's, it turns out to be very, very nice if you've got people who know Groovy. And it happens to use, if you've got uh, JavaScript programmers that know jQuery, it happens to use a lot of terms that are uh, they'll be very familiar with. So it's got very, very low learning curves. For, for, so it's, it's a very nice one to play with. So any Java people, Groovy people, Scala people, they'll be quite happy with, with this sort of stuff. Um, so this is the test. And it's actually, this is still the low-level test. Okay, I haven't gone and refactored this into the DSL yet. But by choosing a more modern, so HTML unit has been around for quite a number of years, very rock solid and stable, and in the features that it provides, does that very well. Um, there's, if you go and use one of the more modern ones, and uh, Jeb is a, is a good example here, um, the actual low-level code is actually at a higher level already, and so that's a good place to start. So, so have a look around at the different drivers, and, and you'll be able to go and pick one of these. So this, this is actually, here's where I'm filling out the form. All right, and this... Jeb itself has already got the concept of a mini testing DSL built into it. So the low level test is actually reasonably high level. And here's where I'm going and looking at the, the, the new page that when we, when we entered the post, it, we, we got taken to a new page. We go and check that all the information that we expect to be there is actually turned up. So the post actually was properly submitted. Okay. Now, why am I showing you this? Because what I want to do is there's actually another concept that um, you might want to do as part of refactoring your testing layers. And this, this is not going to help you in terms of writing testing DSLs uh, that you'd present to customers. You, you'd still do the things I was talking about before, and we'll see more of that. But this will really help to make uh, the concept I'm next going to talk about will really help to make your tests much less brittle, and you'll be able to um, get a big bang for buck when you're writing these things. And it's the concept of pages. So... Those of you who've done a lot of uh, sort of enterprise style uh, development, you would have probably come across, or if you've done GUI style development, you probably come across a term called model view controller. And that's all about, it's a term that's been around since Zero Park days, a long, been a long time. It's all about, if, if I just write big chunks of code that mishmash all of the different concepts when I'm creating a complex application together, it turns out to be quite brittle when I want to make... Uh, quite broad changes. By pulling out the model, which is kind of the, the domain information, and the controller, which is how that domain changes, and the view, which is how I present that, turns out that I can then much more easily refactor that system over time. Okay? Traditionally, we've never applied that concept to our tests. Why not? Our tests are looking at a domain and trying to you know, sometimes test the domain, sometimes test how the domain is presented. And, and so pages is, is one ap approach that does a similar sort of thing in your test code. And so we'll go and look at uh, Jeb with um, pages. And now the details of this, don't get hung up on, on the specific details, but the, it's just the concept that uh, we want to have a look at today. Um, get rid of some of that noise. So what you do when you're using pages, and, and Tellurium and uh, Selenium, you can do pages these days. Uh, Jeb, you can do pages. They all have a very similar thing. The, de the specific details will be different. So if you, if you want to apply this technique, go and look, see whether your uh, framework supports it. A lot of them do these days. And you can do it, always do it yourself, but it, uh, it's nice to have uh, support in your framework. Um, you do a similar thing. This very, the specifics will slightly change. So what do you do? What you're trying to do is capture a... a Basically, the, the domain, uh, the information that relates your domain to your view 
as a separate thing. Okay? So what I'm going to do here is capture that information when I'm on the new post page, and that's what's going to be in this one, and I'm also going to capture it when I'm on the view post page, which is the page I get taken to when I, after I click the submit button. And what I want to do is say things like, oh, well, the, the blog title, now this should be something, this is a word that's in the domain of uh, my subject matter experts or my business analysts. So I want to relate that concept, something that's in my business domain, um, in this case it's blogging domain, so we've got things like the title of the blog and the text inside the blog and the category that you picked, to the presentation, which in this case it's where on the form it is. Okay, what the name of the field might be, and that sort of information. So we capture that in one spot. We do the same thing on the second page. So when I want to go to the main heading, I go and look for a H1 tag and get the text out of it. That's where the heading is. Now if I go and change that, I apply a new style to my pages, I've got one pa place to come and change. I change this information, and my tests will never know about this. They'll only know about the domain concept, main heading, and they're checking the main heading and they'll continue to run with just a, some minor refactoring if I go and change my entire site. So then when I come down to my test, so this is just normal, this is normal Jeb code, this is not any testing DSL applied yet, you'll see things like, um, oh, I want to um, set the blog title value to be this, and I want to set the, um, the text inside the blog to be this, and then uh, I want to click on the post button, or perform the post action, and then I want to go check what the main heading was and check what the author heading was and things like that. Okay, so the tests are now much less brittle. And there's no nothing inside here uh, that is pointing to the actual specific presentation information, which is what we were doing when we were creating our own testing DSL. We were doing that anyway. So if you're already creating your testing DSL, maybe this isn't so important, but I found it really, really valuable to actually do it uh, at the level that your tools support, your framework support, and then if you need to, you can write a thin testing TSL layer on top of this. Okay? So that's just two examples. And let's, let's go on and have a look at some other stuff. I want to have a look at uh, some runners here. So what I was showing you was stuff that would run inside an IDE or on a continuous integration server. And as I said before, we would typically package that up so that non uh, developers can also run it by either providing them with a, a web console or a, a, a Groovy console or some other similar means where they can run things locally without having to set up any class paths, without having to install anything else. And um, that's the kind of thing we typically do. Um, but let's have a look at some runners that try to take you further than uh, what the... If, if you don't do that kind of effort yourself, runners can take you some of the way there and we'll have a look at some of these runners now. Um, now, I should just say that turns out the tools don't naturally fall into all the different categories that I was saying, the sort of drivers and then runners. There's bits of overlap. So web test is probably um, arguably halfway between, it, it, it's a driver, maybe a slightly high level driver. Um, so it's, it's a small way towards having a, a textual based sort of runner. And turns out you can write tests in uh, XML code which is the stuff that's here. If you've got um, testers who don't like coding but kind of happy with declarative XML flavor, you can give them this. Turns out you can give them um, groovy versions as well, uh, which is on, uh, well, I'm not actually showing it here, but you can, um, it's got recorders and things, and you can actually get the groovy code or uh, XML code uh, spitting out from these recorders and, and stash them away. Just remember, if you go and use recording tools, they're often a good place to start. They're kind of good training wheels, but they're typically, the stuff that they produce is typically not refactored. And so you typically don't want to take it whole as bold as is. You want to, you can potentially use this as a base and then go and manually refactor it and put it into your test suite. Um, turns out even the latest tools actually do support some of the refactoring type things that I'm talking about. So if you go and look at Twist from uh, ThoughtWorks and there's three or four of them that are now starting to support uh, that style of thing. But if, if you're working with a whole lot of open source tools like we do, we tend not to need those tools, but there, there's some really good ones that are, are coming out that you might want to have a look at. Um, here's another way. So this is, this is moving a bit further away to sort of textual style runners. This is an easy B example. And we tend to write things like this. So it turns out that the stuff that's inside here is, a, is our testing DSLs, typically. Uh, well, there's a... Actually there's, there's actually, there's actually several different ways in which we do this. 
I'll, I'll, I'll um, retract the previous one. I'll, we'll come back to that in a bit. So um, when we're doing uh, agile development, we'll typically write the story using statements like this. So we'll have a scenario, and we'll do given when then. You've probably seen that sort of style, and it'll be English looking. And we'll often have that as the story card that you know when, when you get when a pair signs up for um, to do another bit of work or something, they'll go grab something like that, and they'll write uh, underneath it. So inside here, I'll have and I have selected home as the category or something, and one of these is probably on the next one. We'll start to fill in. Um, Where's the home is the category. Someone will start filling in, and this one here isn't, isn't written using the uh, testing DSL. Actually, the, the one that's on GitHub does use the testing DSL. So you'll actually see inside here the testing DSL. Um, and that's the kind of thing that we typically fill in. So the, the work that's involved starts off with what the customer expects the system to, how it to behave, and You'll typically fill in um, using a testing DSL, maybe, maybe not the low, the low level that I've got here, some more information, and uh, that's how the work on that card will progress. And then you'll fill in the feature in the, um, in the production system, run the test, and it should then pass, and then, and then you're done. Okay, you'll get nice, pretty reporting coming out of these sorts of systems that um, you, so I can't enlarge the font very easily on over on here, but it's the English wording that you saw before. It gets reflected in all the stuff um, that's coming out, and you can even go down into more finer grained detail if you want, and you get nice pretty summaries. If you want to go a different way, you can use uh, jbehave, you can use Cucumber, Robot Framework. I'm not going to go into all the specifics here, but one of the things I'll, I'll just point out uh, to distinguish some of these tools from other ones is there's basically two styles. One is you create the testing DSL like I showed you earlier, and you end up with English-looking text that's ac the actual Groovy code or whatever your language, scripting language you're using might be. That's one style. There's another style where this is just straight English. Okay? And then you'll typically have a mapping mechanism to map that English, those English words onto some code that actually runs your tests. Okay? And that's what Cucumber, Jbehave, uh, Robot Framework, uh, Concordian, um, what's the other one that does that? Um, Tumblr. So those ones are all, all of this nature. Now, there's pros and cons to the different approaches. If I've got the Groovy code and I've gone to the trouble of getting full IDE completion, then I'll, I'll actually have full IDE support, which if I've got developers writing the tests, they'll be really happy with that. If I've got non-developers writing the tests, they don't really care. If it's just English-looking stuff to them. Whether it's got a mapping layer or not, they don't really care. So it won't make much difference to which of those you choose if you've got non-developers writing the tests. If you've got developers writing the tests, I'd typically push you towards writing, use your scripting language to actually write the tests. Now, just to give you a flavor, uh, I'll just, just to show you, um, so this is jbehave. Cucumber and Robot Framework will be very, very similar. Um, to give you a flavor of what's going on here, um, so one of the things I've entered dollar title as the title is a bit of English, and that's the kind of thing um, I've en uh, when I've entered Bart was here as the title, that's the type of thing that would be typed in as part of your test. The mapping file actually uh, converts from that. In this case here, I've got the low-level code, but in the uh, GitHub example, I've got calling the testing DSL. So normally we'd have just one line of testing DSL inside here these days. But basically... This has to match up with the English text that you saw. Dollar title will get substituted for whatever the actual real value was, and then the title will actually get the, it'll be the thing that you pass into your testing DSL. Okay? So someone has to write these mapping files. Now it turns out, you often, when you get started with this sort of stuff, you'll have a developer write those mapping files, if you're going this, this way. Similarly, if you go the other way and have groovy code as your thing, you'll have a, you'll have a, a developer typically write the testing DSL for you. But once, once you actually get, start to get familiar with this, most of my customers now, um, if, if they've got a change to make, uh, this is so simple for them, they'll come in here and they'll just cut and paste the Groovy code, paste another one in, and cr create a new term. And th they'll do that you know, once every two months or something like that. They'll ha add another five or six lines to their little testing DSL. They don't need to call us. It's very, very simple. They just take this stuff. What They know what they need to do is very, very similar. They'll just go and pattern match in their brain, and they'll say, yep, 
well, I want, instead of title there, I want category, and they'll, they'll, they can work it all out. It's, 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 it is very, very simple. Um, but you may need some help uh, getting started with this stuff, so get a developer in to, to, um, to get yourself started. Jbehave's got some interesting things. It's got a little online, uh, you can move everything online and give your uh, business analyst or customer uh, uh, subject matter experts a little web console where they can just type stuff into a web console, hit run, and it's got like documentation in there, what the available uh, phrases are that you can have inside your tests. So it's got some nifty things. The other ones have got some of the things coming. Um, Okay, so um, that's, they're the kind of run, oh, I didn't show you the wiki, the wiki, um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to come back to this Einstein's riddle, don't, don't be upset, we'll come back to that one. Actually, I've got a different sample I can show you. Um, the other direction that you can go, in, in, instead of just having that textual format, is you can move to sort of wiki format. And you'll write your test in a sort of wiki like this, and you can just go, and if you need a new test, you can just add a new line in the wiki. Okay. Um, I haven't found this to be uh, anywhere near as flexible to get on to be able to, in the past to be able to do the refactoring at the different layers, or to be able to do some of the advanced things that we're going to get onto in the in the remaining time that we've got. So I've kind of moved. I've sort of urged people away from this. It was kind of really really neat and tidy in its early days before the testing DSLs got as advanced as they are now. Um, these days it hasn't, it, uh, I think they're actually behind, the sort of wiki style ones are behind, but they're now starting to get the refactoring stuff. And um, if you go on the website, you'll actually see um, the, there's a, a slim based version of this test. There's a thing called Zebium, which is sort of, a, it's, a, it's um, uh, a very, very simple thing to install and you can then uh, write wiki style tests like this that are using WebDriver under the covers and it's using, um, uh, we, we use a groovy testing, testing fixtures in there if we, if we need to, but it's got fitness and stuff underneath it. Uh, if you go and look at Zabrieve, it actually is a, a system, it's, it's still sort of at the sort of research level, I would say. Um, it's a system that actually allows you to move things at the fitness level, at the wiki level, and start refactoring the kind of testing DSL refactoring that I was doing. You can do it at the wiki level. Okay, so that's a very, very powerful thing. And you can basically move from low level fitness style tests up to just having examples. Okay, and that's kind of very declarative style and it's, um, you know, you just have valid credit cards, here they are, some incorrect ones, some expired ones, and so on. And just by listing out those, that's a very declarative way, a very uh, clear way to ex express your intent. That's the co also the kind of thing you should be doing in your, you should be moving your testing DSLs to look like that as well, but in sort of English looking uh, style. Okay, so I, won't, I, won't, I haven't got time to go into more details. There's some uh, references there where you can uh, go into more details. What I want to do now, we haven't got a lot of time left, so I want to look at some novel things that I very rarely see in the customers that I go in that are doing testing, that, but they're really easy to do and they have enormous benefit. So we'll, we'll quickly have a look. Um, so this is, this is our little blog system. You can see it's got categories and it's got a, a bunch of different values here. Work, school, home. Uh, there's a bunch of different authors. Bart, home, Marge, um, Bart, home and Marge and so on. Now, what if I want to write tests that cater for all those different um, combinations of things there? Okay. So first of all, is that a good, a good thing to do or not? Depends. Yeah, it depends. The consult oh, good, you've got the message. Yeah, if you're consultants, you've got to always, always come back with that first off. Yeah. Then work out your customer's budget and then, oh, sorry, no, 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 you, no sorry, we, we didn't go there. Um, so it depends. So you've got to still do the standard testing analysis of, okay, so I'm doing um, insurance loans or something, and I know that if you're in a suburb that has lots of crime, and you live right near the, the, the flood uh, plain, and you're um, under 18, and you've had accidents before, you're probably going to get a really bad uh, credit rating. And so you'd go and look at things like age and uh, gender and start suburb, and you'd say, yes, my the formulas that I create that work out your premium probably have all of those things in them. Therefore, those variables are probably all uh, dependent. Right? If you've got something that's independent, that you might just say, oh, anyone who's under 18, we're not going to ensure, end of story. It's probably not going to interact with any other variables. You can probably just test the, the, 
the, the true and the false, the happy path and the, the, the sad path for that variable, and just do interaction on your other variables. So this, it's a, this is a, a sort of a complex topic that I can't do justice for today, but what I'm going to show you is when uh, you should be trying to embed the, your test case design information in your, at the testing DSL level. So if you've got a variable that's independent, it should be clear in your test that I'm testing this independently. If you've got things that are interact, that should be clear in your, in your tests. Okay? Now, I haven't got a lot of time to go into that. But for, this, for the purposes of this test, we're going to assume that the author and the category are, are potentially have interactions. And so if I want to test all, all combinations, I've seen people go and get the whiteboard out. Where'd the whiteboard go? No, it's not here. They'd sit all around it, they'd work out all the combinations, they'd write all those up, and then they'd go and create 450 manual tests or whatever that the, the whiteboard said to do, feed those into the system, and you know, six months later they say, oh, we now need to add another uh, category in here, or there's a new, a new author on the blog now. Oh, what tests do we need to add? Oh, I don't know, we've got this 450 tests, I've got no idea how they were created, I'm not sure which ones are important. Um, plus, you know, the test suite's starting to take too long, and, and all the information is lost on why you created those tests, what value are those tests providing. So what I'm suggesting to you is keep it, and we'll skip over this example that uh, uh, explains um, another example. If, if you've got things where you're trying to test across the combinations of things, just have them in your test suite, uh, go.combinations, and then call out to your testing DSL for each of the combinations and things like that, okay? Now, I'm not going to try, I don't really want to go into the specifics of the code that's here, but the important thing is that captured in our test here, we're saying for every combination of author, for every combination of category, and for, a, for, for some reason these particular three uh, titles, or well, contents, uh, I want every combination of those catered for. Go and do them all. And you just go and run this, and it comes back and it says it found, well, that's because I'm printing out the size of them. It says it found 75 combos, and just, it just runs them all, right? Um, so if that's important and all of these variables interact, um, that's a, a, a good thing to do. Turns out that usually testers won't run all of the combos. The test suites typically will take some time to run. And it also turns out that bugs typically arise when two features interact, not when you've got n things that are all, you know, you don't, you don't need to test every combination typically. So it, it'll usually be, Okay, so um, Bart doesn't go to work. So if you put in Bart and put in work, 404 error or something like that. So it's, it's only when those two fields interact do we have a problem. So as long as we check that, have a test where Bart and work are both in the test and we see what happens, we're covered. And while that test is running, it might also be testing other things for us. So there's a, there's a thing called um, orthogonal arrays or all pairs testing or um, so on. We can just do that and I'll, I'll skip over the theory. But basically there's libraries now that produce these things. So um, this is going to produce all the all pairs, and we run this, and uh, oh, this is actually st still showing you the um, combinations. Oh no, it's, it didn't show you the um, number. Where did that go? Oh, there it is, 18. 18. So instead of 75, we've now got 18, but every single combination is still catered for in this, in this example. Okay. So, um, but you need to understand which of your variables are independent, which might interact, and so on. And, and that should be reflected in your test cases. And keep it in the test case. Don't put it up on the whiteboard, do your brainstorming, and then everyone who's involved in the project is left. There's the consultant's gone, the people on the original team have been reassigned or left the organization. No one knows you know, what the value of these things were. Keep all that in your test case. Okay, we're going to look at a thing called quick check quickly. And... Uh, this is a thing that does random uh, data generation for you, but it actually is very, very smart. And I, I don't want to go into all the details here, but you can do things like, um, I want a random value from an enumerated set of fixed values. Or you can be really smart and say, oh, I want random values b between one and, and uh, uh, between 100 and 999, but not between 500 and 599 for some reason. No one ever, they're, they're um, stock codes that we don't use anymore or something, so there's no point in trying to test those or whatever. And here we're going to actually write our own little generator that, that uh, takes a random number from 1 to 12 and turns it in using the date formatting stuff, turns it into uh, August or July or whatever. And you can then even be even more fancy and say, well, we're going to have a frequency generator that says 50% of the time we're going to have a one of those pets, 
30% of the time one of those numbers and 20% of the time we're going to have a month. I don't know why you'd ever want to do that, but it, you typically have different, um, on your websites, you might have a, a certain profile of the kind of rough ages of people or the, you know, Typically, do you have male or females coming to your site? And you can steer your test suite to capture that kind of information and, and express that in your test suite. So, we're, what we would be saying here is, you know, 60% of the the people who are uh, on my shopping site are, are female. So I'm going to have 60% of my test suites going to have females in the test suites and you know, capture your age brackets and have a lot in there. And then when you generate, we just say create ourselves 20 tests because that might, we might have worked out how long the tests suite takes to do, we, we get 20 tests pop out here and it's a mixture of all the things that we saw. We can see there's 30% of the orange there, 50% of the green and 20% of the blue. Right? So you can do all smart things with these sorts of tests. Here's the example on our blog. We're going to have any string for the title, any string for the content and we're going to just select fixed values for these. So it's, in this case it was pretty simple. It's not reflecting anything exciting but um, we just go and hit go. And it goes and tries, it's, it's actually a pretty smart little test generator. It goes and tries to pick, pick ugly scenarios for us. It'll pick the empty string. When we want a string, any string or whatever, it'll pick the empty string. It'll pick one with ugly Unicode characters in us, a single at sign, and it'll do all sorts of um, weird boundary cases automatically for us. So there's some smarts built into the frame. We don't care about that. We just say, generate some random test cases for us. And it goes, goes and does that. So that's a very useful thing to look at. And we'll skip on. Model-based testing, we saw some of this. We saw a little um, uh, state machine for phishing in the previous talk. Okay? Turns out you can capture the uh, expected observed behavior of your system as a little state machine. Now, you've got to be careful. If you, put a, if you write a bug into your state machine, that bug will be reflected in your test. So you've got to be very careful here. But typically, you can capture these things in a declarative way, like we saw in the, in the previous talk, and it, they tend to be very, very simple and, and can be done in a declarative way. The order won't be important and so forth. And um, you can get very, very nice uh, solutions for this. So here's a little one for a vending machine. You can put in, uh, this is a US example, you can put in quarters and other, other things and eventually after you've got four of them in there, you can hit vend and your thing comes out or and you can account for hitting the reject coin button and all sorts of things in your model if you, if you want to. Um, there's a little, here's some, a little bit of code to do that. We're going to skip over that. Uh, that's, that's running the code. Here's an example that does it for the blog. I'm not going to go into the details. Turns out to be not very hard to do. And we actually write a testing DSL, uh, uh, a logic DSL above this, so you won't even see all of this. And it'll actually look like the English phrases we saw before. And that's capturing the, what the business logic is. And that's how we write it. And this is what's happening underneath the covers. But the part I want to show you is, built into these sorts of frame, the modeling frameworks, is a lot of smarts. And this goes, you can just go and say, oh, generate me 50 tests randomly walking through your model. And there's, you can actually go and pick the different, there's um, different algorithms that get used for walking random trees of things. We don't need to go into the details of that. But you can go and get it to do that. And then to print out little graphs, this is the, the actual test run on our system. We'll skip over the details. And it'll print out a little graph, and this shows you which parts of the tree this, of the state machine it actually walked along. By giving it 50 tests, it actually didn't cover everything. The white things here weren't covered. The yellow things are covered a lot. So this, it actually, every, every test involved starting on the home page, every test finished at the same point. Um, but there were some paths through our website that weren't traversed. And we can now come and do, get, we get these pretty graphs and uh, decide whether it's important or not that these weren't covered. If it's important, we just come back here and say, yep, make it 60 tests, make it 100 tests, whatever, whatever I need, and it'll go and uh, do this. So that's another novel thing to do, and it's very easy to do. There's uh, more details there on some of the libraries that you can go use, and a very, very powerful approach you can look at. Okay. Another thing, if you've ever seen Prolog, or you could do this in PostScript now, I guess, as well. I didn't know that before. Um, I'm using a, uh, actually this example uses, uses Prolog under the covers of a testing DSL, a groovy testing DSL, as well as using a, a Choco library and there's a JCOP library you can use as well. This is a, a sample we'll skip over, we'll go straight to the uh, web, web testing one. Um, what you do is you, um, and again, we write a, t a layer above this. So I'm showing you this under the covers, under the kimono here, um, the details, and you do things like, um, I'll, this one here, we've observed the behavior of our bloggers during the week, and we've got, we've noticed various business rules, 
and we'll, we'll see those captured in a minute. Certain people only blog on certain days and only if certain other people have blogged the day before or the day after and things like that. We've, that that's the observations we've made. We can capture that as business logic rules in this logic constraint language and we say things like, well, Lisa, at the, all we know at the moment is that somewhere between Sunday and Saturday, if, you know, if I can use zero to six here as uh, the days of the week, is when Lisa will blog, similarly for Marge and so on. And a bit further down, we'll add a constraint that says, actually, when Lisa blogs, oh, so we, we've, we've observed that Lisa blogs only on a Monday, a Wednesday, or a Friday, and you can actually feed that information basically into these constraint type programs. Again, we've hidden, we usually hide this below a layer that actually lets our users type that in exactly as you see it there. Lisa blogs only on a Monday, Wednesday, or Friday. That's what they type in. This is what's happening underneath the covers. And what happens after you've done a list? You just say go, and it produces the test cases. Okay? If one of the business rules changes, you go change that business rule, hit go, and a different number of tests might pop out here. Right? The, the thinking behind why you came up with these test cases, it's, it's captured actually in the test case because you've got all your business rules for the things that are important to you there. You haven't gone and worked it on a whiteboard, captured it all, written, manually written your test cases, and then everyone forgot, how do we do that? We, we now need to do another one. Oh, no, how do we do that? We had some, someone who helped us create this, and now we don't know what to do. So keep it, keep it in that form. Now, I'm just about out of time. Um, I've just briefly look at what haven't I told you about. Um, actually, that's probably the most of the stuff that I wanted to say. So, so basically, don't be afraid to go and use some advanced techniques. So there's libraries out there that let you capture the, the testing constraints in very, very novel ways. Um, you can see here the scripting opens that up, but you can use non-scripting things as well if you want. And there's, there's lots of ways where you can actually capture the smarts in the actual scripts themselves. So I'd encourage you to do that. Okay, I think I'm just about out of time. So um, I'd like to thank Paul oh. for greatly increasing my tool set in a scary mm -hmm. way. I think while Jason sets up, you might have time for one or two questions. So. Okay. And this is a thank great. You. Thank you very much.